Welcome everyone to our last and final class, class number eight. We finally made it up the ladder to the eighth step. God willing, we should just continue to grow in this amazing, amazing journey. And uh, as they say, the, the cherry on the cake is today and God willing will um, culminate this beautiful series. And again, I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank um, Sarah Esther. I'm sure I'll say my thank yous at the end as well, but um, thank you to all you ladies who have written and who have, um, you know, been very outspoken of how much these uh, classes have helped them. They, I know they've helped me. Um, Sarah Esther and I both agree. We really needed this very, very badly. And we just uh, said, you know what, we're going to do whatever we need to do to make sure that we don't go into this year um, feeling, you know, uh, that we don't have the Kaleem as, at least as best as we can. So um, I'm going to give it over to Sarah Esther. And today we're going to talk about what is your legacy? Boy, that was, that was, it was a question I had to really ask myself in preparing for this class. Sarah Esther, I want to hear what you have to say. Thank you, everybody. Our eighth class. I took this class very seriously. I purchased a new camera. As you could see me very uh, strongly on your screen now. It was probably better view than before. But uh, here I am talking about legacy. I reached out to big rabbis in my life, big rabbis, my teachers, and asked their input. So what I'm going to share today comes from uh, Rabbi Kiva Tatz, Y.Y. Jacobson, Rabbi Manis Friedman, and um, Rabbi Tintipor Heller, and their teaching. So I start with a beautiful quote that I actually said at my son's bar mitzvah, but I read it to myself quite often. To realize the value of one year, ask a student who failed a grade. To realize the value of one month, ask a mother who gives birth to a premature baby. To realize the value of one week, ask the editor of a weekly newspaper. To realize the value of one hour, ask people that are in love that are waiting for a meeting. To realize the value of one minute, ask a person who just missed the train. To realize the value of one second, ask someone who just avoided an accident. To realize the value of one millisecond, ask the person who won a silver medal at the Olympics. This is the price of time. There is nothing more important in our lives than time. Um, Non-Jewish sources say that time is money. Our Jewish teachings teach us that time is life itself. Everything that we do with our time is the most precious commodity to us, to the world, and to our creator. Um, I have just learned from my doing an interview a very interesting idea from Rabbi Laskin. He says, he said, in, in, while we were speaking about transcendence, he says, isn't, isn't it interesting that health is that when you're not feeling your body, when you're well, you're not, your right eye is not reminding you of its existence, your left toe, your pancreas, your nose, any organs that are not screaming to you, ouch, that means you're healthy. So I thought about that quite a lot, and I just tried to dissolve myself in this knowledge. And I realized that perhaps our legacy lies in the fact that we are able to dissolve ourselves in God's will, letting go of our ego. And when we do so, we don't feel ourselves. That's real joy. That's living a life with purpose. There's a fine balance between becoming as or Rita Esther says a shmata, where you're not feeling yourself from a negative perspective. When you're dissolving, say, I don't care, I'm nothing. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Where's God? God is wherever you let him in. If you become his vehicle, his vessel, he will fill all your space. But you come and do that from the place of strength, not from the place of abandonment and weakness. It is very important to understand that we are constantly walking this fine tightrope between Avram's, Avram Avino had two notes in, in his two pockets, as we call it. One is, I'm dust and ashes. I'm nothing. I come from nothing. I go back to the earth. And the second one where it said, of course, such an empowering statement, the world was made just for me. 
So if we come and realize and embrace these two concepts, and we realize that we are so powerful, the Lubavitcher Rebbe said, at birth, Hashem said, and proclaim to the world and to the universe, you matter. You are the most important soul that had to come in into this world today at this second, millisecond. You matter. So if you nullify yourself from the perspective of strength, not from the perspective of in, insignificance from depression or insignificance from feeling down and they feel like you cannot contribute anything. We talked about trying to find your you, your inner personal strength. And you create place for God and do not feel yourself so strongly, your needs, your wants, every single second nullifying that ego and go with the will of God every single moment, taking your next step, whatever is that step might be, perhaps you will leave a legacy of light, the ultimate legacy. Hashem created space for us. When he created this world, we know that he hid, he hid himself, creating void that we are able to exist, thinking that we are independent of him, capital H, and of course, thinking of the fact that we have an ability and we are able to choose. We're not able to choose the circumstances. We are able to choose our reactions to the circumstances, our, real, re, our emotions, the way we take our next step in life. Now, I told this to Arit when we spoke privately. I once heard a trivia question that I thought was so profound. And the question went like this, what sign on a keyboard signifies your entire life. It could be, it encompasses your entire life. So people of course started saying that perhaps it's a infinite infinity sign, number eight laying down, right? Infinity sign. But because of the time, we're not gonna do trivia right now. I'll just give you the answer. The answer is a dash sign. Every tombstone has a date of birth, then a dash, and then a date of death, right? When you go to a cemetery, that dash, is your life that dash is all you have that dash is your legacy you're brought to this world without your conscious knowledge in, in in this world you're born and then you die we don't know when but the dash is your responsibility rabbi manis friedman constantly talk about existence versus living you could have a wonderful existence you can exist with 400, uh, f f you know, extravagant things, 400 pieces of jewelry and, and mansions and cars and things you need, and you may not have a life because that is just existence. But then you may have a very vibrant life and you might be very humble, a humble person. Existence means you're brought into this world. The, the, the birth date is written on that stone, that stone that is prepared for all of us. That is existence, but the dash is life. The vibrance that you put into that dash is your legacy. I'm thinking about this these days because my beautiful grandmother left this world and she left such a powerful legacy of transcendence. That's what that interview was about with Rabbi Laskin. It's on my Facebook page. Um, she has encountered so many difficulties in her life from hunger to death to pain, difficult depression, but she kept on singing and dancing through life. And as I write with Tombstone, I cannot help myself but think about legacy. She did not live a legacy behind where we feel that she was a victim of her circumstances. Even though she was a widow, she had a handicapped child, she was an orphan. Her legacy, her legacy was the one of a woman who was able to transcend and able to continue dancing and marching forward and transcending those difficult dark days and years of her life. She did not give up. That is her legacy. It's not what happened to her, but how she handled it. We are now standing on the, soul, on the shoulders of the giants of people that lived before us. We are the generation of, that is confused. It's hard for us. We're in, we're in darkness. But all those that lived before us, as I told you last time, they left number zero behind. And if we put our little, little tiny ahad one, number one, we do our absolute best. We connect ourselves to that link of such magnificent legacy and power of all those giants, people that had so much wisdom and prophecy and connection and clarity. Yes, we're lacking a lot of it. 
That's the sadness of our generation, but that is also the power of our generation because when it's a dark room and you put on a little tiny candle, the room becomes so bright and you appreciate it. Yet when you walk into the light room and you turn on that candle, right? You don't see the difference. We make such a difference in this dark world. The fact that we're here at 12.11 on a Wednesday before Rosh Hashanah, 12.11 um, New York time, of course, it's, it's incredible. The world is illuminated because of us. You are such bright, vibrant lights. You know, uh, I just uh, want to tell you that sometimes when I teach, I feel disempowered because I see teenagers that just mentioned that off camera texting, uh, you know, young adults, not so interested. I teach NCSY sometimes, different organizations. And uh, Rabbi Kiva Tatz told me that if you change one person while you're teaching, you bring light. And then he added, even if that person is yourself. If we have changed just one person through our, our program, or me tonight, and that person is Sophia, Sarah Esther, and Marielle, and Miriam, and Michelle, and Gabby, and one person changes, that was worthwhile. There's light and fireworks on this world, right? Because we sometimes think that, you know, to make a change has to be grandiose. It has to be on uh, national news, something big. What is my legacy? Legacy has to be big. Uh, well, at least I have to be, you know, on the level of Moses or, you know, Est Queen Esther or what, what a legacy, you know, your legacy is your dash, but it is all you could do. And that is all that's required of you. My uh, dear Tzadik, Rab Zuse of Anopoli, he said that when I go to heaven and meet my creator, I will not be asked why I'm not like Abraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov or Rocha, Leah, right? Sarah, Esther, Rivka. I'm going to be asked, was I Zusia? Was I Sophia? Was I Sarah Esther? Was Orit Orit Esther? Was I the best version? We're told that every mitzvah, every good deed, every attempt to bring light creates a portrait of us in heaven. Every portrait is presented to us at the time when we arrive. We look at ourselves in an allegorical mirror and we look at our portrait of what we could have been, whatever we could have painted while we had this split second in this world. And we see that a nose is missing, an eye is not complete, an ear is half done. We feel, we feel traumatized. My God, why didn't I complete that portrait? Because sometimes we're lazy and sometimes we feel disempowered and sometimes the darkness comes and engulfs us because we failed yesterday. We failed 10 years ago. Now we have to read the consequences. But you know what? That is in the past. All we have is this moment. And if we dissolve ourselves in this moment, dissolve ourselves to letting go of our ego. And ego includes that darkness that tells us you're nothing. You failed in the past. It's too late. It's too late. Slava Young Rice, daughter of Rabbits and Young Rice, a famous speaker, a mommy of our generation, right? My, my, personal, my personal leader. She was such a tiny powerhouse, such a powerful woman who survived Holocaust. Her lectures are obviously available. Rabbits and Young Rice, probably you all heard and read her books. Slavi said yesterday in her class that a little girl started crying as she came to her lecture. And she, after the lecture, Slavi came and spoke to the little girl and said, why are you crying? She was 10 years old. She says, we used to have Shabbos. Mommy used to light candles. And then my dad passed away. Mommy got very discouraged and she got angry. She got disempowered and she stopped. And I realized that that's it. I want it so bad, but I can't have it back. And Slavi said, why can't you have it back? Why can't you have it back? She says, it's too late because my dad is not here. It's not the same thing. We can't sit with the family like we used to. It's just me and my mom. And Slavi says, you absolutely can. You absolutely, every day, every week, every moment, you can return to your creator. Nothing is lost forever. Today is another day. This week is another week. We don't know the place ahead. We don't know the surprise that Shem has for us. You see the surprise of this year where we all find ourselves, we're placed strategically exactly where we did not think we would be in a million years, right? We would not think that we would be where we are. And yet, Hashem can surprise us whatever way in his master plan is designed, 
We, all we do is we are exactly where he wants us to be, and we take our next step in serving him, trying to annul, trying to, trying to not squash our ego, but accept his will in, with dignity. Somebody wrote to the Lubavitcher Rebbe the following letter. I would like the Rebbe's help. I wake up each day sad and apprehensive. I can't concentrate. I find it hard to pray. I keep the commandments, but I have no spiritual satisfaction. I go to the synagogue, I feel alone. I begin to wonder what life is about. I need help. The Rebbe sent the letter back in the following way. I'm going to raise it up. I hope you can see. He circled every single I. Do you see? Every single sentence begins with I. The Rebbe's advice was clear, it was wordless, but so profound. Perhaps if you don't start every single sentence of your life with I, you won't feel the way you do. Maybe start the day with what can I do for other people, for the world. If you begin with an I, you feel empty because all you are is your own self, your ego. You make no room for God. Where's God? Again, it's wherever you let him in. Whatever you let him in. Create space for him as he created space for us. I uh, <clears throat> like to mention that Many years ago, as maybe you've read the news, Stephen Kotloff, um, he was a, a Jew who was a reporter, journalist. He was unfortunately decapitated by ISIS. And while he was not a religious person, that was the last thing he said. And it was sent to his parents and they shared it with the world. He said the following, just a few hours before his execution. Everyone has two lives. The second begins when you realize that you only have one. My dear friends, perhaps the legacy before this Rosh Hashanah is to realize we have one life. And the minute we have that realization and knowledge and clarity, we start a second life. We don't have to wait for the end, for the situation or diagnosis or being on deathbed in another hundred years. We can do it right now. We only have one life. And when we realize that, we live a different life. We shine wherever you are, and we write a collective scroll of Jewish destiny. As I mentioned to you in our first class, your letter is unique. It should not look like anyone else's letter. If you write an olive and look around and someone else is writing a bet, you feel disempowered. You feel perhaps that something's wrong with you. Nothing's wrong with you. You are writing your story, your own dash, your own dash, how you want to be remembered by. We have to respect our natural gifts. We're told that Yaakov, our forefather, he blessed his children before his death with revealing to them their innate traits. So he did not say to his children, I want you to be a doctor and I want you to be a lawyer. He said, I see you're very patient. Perhaps you should be a teacher. I see that you are very businesslike. Perhaps you could be busy with business and support your brother who's learning. The biggest gift is to reveal to yourself and those that have children to reveal their innate gift. Because I read a, read a Hasidic story that, that if you don't, a person came to the rabbi and he said, what should my child be? And he said, he should be a teacher, even though you want him to be a shoemaker, but he should be a teacher. So she, he should not ask questions later. He should not have a question later. So the father came back. He couldn't understand what question. What, what question would he have later? He says, you see, he becomes a shoemaker and he has to make stitches. But he's not, he's not born to do that. And every stitch is going to be difficulty. It's going to come through such toil and negativity. And he's going to hate every moment of that. And he's going to look around at other shoemakers. And they're not it. They're born to be shoemaker making stitches and cutting leather and putting shoes together. Soles attaching to the upper side of the shoe. And they're doing it with joy. And he's sitting there thinking, why am I incapable? Why am I not able to accomplish? You know why? Because you're riding the wrong ship. You're not in, the, in your place in the world where you're supposed to be. When you do what you love, every day is joy. But when you're not writing your own letter, but trying to copy someone else, every single moment, every breath becomes a burden. And you think something's wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. Help your children. Help yourself find that innate gift because once you do you are writing your legacy 
who is wise. Love that. We have to include that. The one who is strong. You know, it's, of course, it's Jewish wisdom. what? Who is strong. The, the one who overpowers his own evil inclination. Who is wise. The one who learns from everybody. And who is rich. One who is satisfied with his own lot. I think if we can incorporate that philosophy into our personal lives. A strong person is not who won competition or strong enough in his ability to communicate at work and, you know, sign contracts in today's day. Strong is the one that knows where he belongs when he can be quiet when it's time to stop speaking and he can laugh when he's really not in the mood. Who is rich? Oh, boy, oy, oy. this is the plague of our generation. Who is rich? Vacations, fancy shoes, fancy clothes, Facebook, Instagram, nonstop, nonstop. Are these people rich? Are they living or are they existing? We don't know. We can only hope it's a combination of both. The only dash we're right is our own. We don't know. If you're rich, you feel it in your heart. It doesn't matter. Things are beautiful. I, I'm an immigrant. I, I know what it's like to be without things. We went and collected trash. My mother would let me wear anything that goes directly to your body. But anything that comes over your body, such as jackets and uh, hoodies and shoes. We were very poor. I know things are important. I know what it's like to live without them. I know what it's like to turn around and look at other teenagers that look pretty. And I wore things from garbage. I know what it's like. But that's not what likes, makes life worth living. It's important. I understand. But that's not what rich means. You know, I want to again emphasize that we are living our own legacy. The tree of life was in the center of the garden. You know why it was in the center? Because there were main paths that led to the center. Everyone had their own path. It was not the right way or the wrong way. Everybody, of course, is leaving according to Torah and mitzvahs. We know what to do, but it's your way to find that tree of knowledge, tree of knowledge that leads you back to self. Just wrote an article and concluded it with the following phrase. If you don't mind, I'll share. The phrase went like this. The medieval saying says that all roads lead to, the, to Rome, right? We know that all roads lead to Rome. But our Jewish sages help us understand that all roads lead back to yourself. Your authentic, real self that is connected to your creator. That's where all your roads lead. You think you're going somewhere. Remember that story? But you're only going within. All the other actions in the world are there to help you navigate your inner world. You're, you're going constantly inside yourself. You're meeting people. You're making decisions. You think you're signing contracts, those that do you, making meals. You, you are supposed to do that. But the ultimate goal, as you write your dash, your legacy, is to find the space in yourself where you can make room for God. And the more room you create for wholesomeness, for godliness inside yourself, putting away your ego, creating the vessel, you become a conduit of light in this world. And Hashem becomes your vehicle. Every day I personally share, I wake up and I say to God, please send me wherever I'm needed. Let me be a conduit of light and love. Let me help those that need a word of advice, a listening ear, a smile. And Hashem does. That's the interesting thing. Because if you wake up, and you set your mind to, I want to go where I'm needed. I want to show empathy that, to those that are alone. I want to be there in a moment of darkness for those that need light. Hashem says, no problem. That's what you want, of course. It is very, very important that you understand that your road is unique. The Garden of Eden placed the tree in the middle. So don't look around. Look only at your own path. I'll say a few more stories. My goodness, we're running out of time. I'll, I'll skip my meditation because I really have so much beautiful uh, wisdom to share, please. Um, there is a man who every morning looked, uh, looked at the horizon and he saw a house with golden windows. It was so beautiful because the sun was reflected in the windows. And he decided one day he's going to go and find that house and live there. So he 
all days he just kept walking and walking and walking and seemed much further than he thought. He finally arrived, knocked on the door. But, you know, it seemed like a regular house now that he approached it. And he knocked on the door and he said, I've been walking for days. I thought this, I'm looking for a house with the golden windows. When the sun set, it becomes golden. It's illuminated. It's so beautiful. I want to live here. It's a golden, magical house. And the woman of the house said, oh, you silly man. Look back. You see that house pointing to his? See, every day when the sun rises, that house, that house you just came from, three, walk, three days walk away. That is the house with the golden winds, as you silly, not this one. Have you ever thought that perhaps we are living in the house with the golden windows? It is our life that is to be celebrated. We're always looking for those houses in the gold, with the golden shining windows while we're living in one. Or we can make ours to be one. A man was, two men were stuck in the cave with a blind person who did not know how to orient himself without any flicker of light. He didn't see anything, but he only saw light and helped him get oriented. So every morning, one of the men that was stuck with this guy decided to feed him because he was worried he would die from malnourishment. So he would literally help him put, find his mouth and put spoon inside with some nourishment. And the other man kept on digging. He said, the minute I dig a little hole and the light will seep in, He'll find his own mouth. He'll find his own way. The best way to fight the darkness, as the Lubavitch Rabbi taught, is to kindle the light. Do not deal with darkness. Do not fight the darkness. Do not even perhaps acknowledge the darkness. Just find the light. Find the light around you. Ignite the light. If you can't find it, make one. Because we are all capable of lighting our own inner candle. And you know what? We have 77,000 thoughts per day. 77,000 thoughts per day. That's a lot of thinking. We can let a lot of them go. We don't have to focus on every one. What if the world is going to end? What if this person is going to leave me? What if this person is going to get sick? What if I will go bankrupt? Do you really have to, okay, they came, they left. Don't pay attention to them. Don't acknowledge them. Don't acknowledge the darkness that comes from nowhere. Just let it go. Let it go. Let it go. I just have a few more, few more points to make. You know, in Africa, I love to travel. That's how I spend my time and money well before COVID. I've been through most countries in the world. And in, I, I learn I learned from people and culture. I also learned that people are good. Most people are the same. They want the same thing. People want peace. People want love for their children. They want education. They want medicine. They want to live with wholesome families. They don't want fighting. They, they, just, they just want to do things that we want to do. And it connects the world. It connects all of us. And I understand and connect to people of all kinds of types and backgrounds and people that look very different from us. So when I was in Africa, the rabbi there, for, I went for Shabbat with my husband. He said the way that they have a problem with crops. Here we have maybe burbs, birds and scarecrows we have to put there they have monkeys and what they do is monkeys eat the crop so the farmers they put pumpkins and make a little hole on the top of the monk, uh, pumpkin and monkeys they love seeds so what they do is they come and they put their paw, palm like inside right and they grab onto the seeds and they get stuck so they want to release themselves from the pumpkin that is now attached. They don't have a sickle, they don't have a mind that you have to release the seeds and get out, but forget, these seeds are not going to work out for you. But what happens is they're monkeys. So they start running in circles and they're nets and they get caught. They die in an attempt to not release the seeds. They just hold on to their seeds. They'd rather die than, than release the palm and release those seeds and get out and save their lives. They just go in circles, right? Isn't this an incredible allegory before Rosh Hashanah? We would rather go down with those seeds in our, in our hands, in circles, in emotional darkness, keep in circles looping, as my uh, life coach says, looping, same thing, same thing, same thing. He did this, he said this, I said this, I don't deserve this. 
same thing, same thing, different terminology. Oh my God, I failed 10 years ago. Now look, look what happened now because of me, this happened again and again and again and again. We're those monkeys. This is a visual for us. The minute you realize you're looping, you understand, right? This thought is returning in a different form for the fourth time. Usually I go, okay, one time it's okay, I'm a human being. Second time, maybe you think I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> you want to repeat yourself. Third, I'll just I'll show patience. Just like to be nice, okay? Fourth time, you got to get up. Get up, that's it. You can't live in my head. You got to get up. You're, it's a horror. I was patient. I was loving. I included you. Now you're out. Not interested. I, am not, I don't want to be that monkey. I don't want to be that monkey. I'm releasing the seeds. You know what? No matter how tasty the seeds are, no matter how you feel you deserve to get this nourishment, you deserve to be treated like, you know what? It's me who's going to get caught. They're living their lives, and I'm going to be trapped in the nets of its horror and darkness, despair. The next day I'll wake up. I'll be in a bad mood. Look what happened yesterday, and I'm going down the hill, that, the hill that I don't want to go down. Oh, I wish we would go on, but it's my time to end. I have not even done third of what I wanted to do. I'm going to do a beautiful end to, I, I, I'll keep my meditation, but I'll give a little homework. Let me just say that we're going to um, have to do a follow-up on the series, Sarah Esther. I mean, there's, it's not possible. I agree with you. I have tons of material that I also want to say. We're going to have to figure out how to do a follow-up on here, huh? Well, God willing, we'll figure that out. So this is my end. It's a real story, guys, real story. In 2005, a real, real estate tycoon, Edward Reichman, passed away in Jerusalem. He was 80 years old, and he left his children a vast fortune worth billions of dollars. He also left two wills, directing that one be opened immediately upon his death, and the other after 30 days. In his first will, he requested to be buried wearing a certain pair of socks. The Reichman children immediately brought them to the burial society, but of course, they refused to bury him with the socks, reminding the family that every Jew is buried in a simple burial shroud and nothing more. So Mr. Reichman was buried without his socks. 30 days later, the second will was opened and it read, ah, oh, I get chills. My dear children, by now, you must have buried me without my socks. I wanted you to truly understand that a man can have a billion dollars, but in the end, he cannot even take along a single pair of socks. What a powerful message. Thank you, Mr. Reichman. He left a legacy for us. I have a sock with me almost always. I have socks different places where I could see them. I encourage you to spend two dollars, buy yourself socks, leave them everywhere, whatever you need a little reminder. If you want that story typed, you can email me at how do I grow at hotmail.com. I'll be happy to send you a pair of socks if you need. <laughs> and a story in writing, I read it to myself quite often. I bless us all to write that dash, a glamorous, wonderful dash of light. And as we live this world and allow other generations to come after us to write their own chapter, their own dash, ours should, our dash, our chapter, our story should shine off the page in the library of collective Jewish destinies. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I got teary-eyed even before I began to speak, so uh, I could just imagine how I'm going to, I already pulled out the tissues, so I, I know I'm going to definitely get, uh, I can't believe in two more days, like I'm just thinking about this, honestly, I'm thinking about in two more days, I'm going to be standing in front of Hashem, more so than today, and I, I do, I take it literally, sta standing like you know, you have an x-ray, you know, just, so I'm going to say what I want to say now for the end of the class, because I actually had a friend of mine say to me today, no, the other day, or whenever it was, I said, you know, I was telling her, I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, it's Rosh Hashanah, I'm afraid, and she said, well, what are you supposed to be? 
with, with, with happiness and it's, it's a later day and, you know, and I said, I understand, but I'm afraid it's a day of du- judgment. I'm going to say what I, what I found out about this conflicting energy of the days of Rosh Hashanah and these days leading up to Rosh Hashanah and, of course, leading up to Yom Kippur are all about. But let's, let's talk a little bit about really what it means to have our legacy. What does it mean? So when we read Bereshit again very soon, what we understand is that life is a cycle, right? As we finish the Sefer of Torah, we are, of course, going back to the beginning and we're again reading again. So we just finish and now we're beginning again. And we need to recognize and live our life as understanding that everything is a cycle. Wherever we find ourselves, we're likely to either find ourselves there again if we haven't finished what we need to, or we need to revisit it and we needed to correct something that essentially was not corrected the first time around. The problem is, is that we're so scared of the idea of the leaving, of the dying, that that gets in the way of the actual process of living, of making something new, right? But the Torah teaches us in Masechet Shabbat, live each day as if it was your last, because we don't know. We will never get each moment we live back, which really fortifies what Sarah Esther was teaching us, is that I, I love the way you, you open the whole class with, you put it so clear how some of us pay attention to years, to days, to hours, to moments, to split seconds, and each one of it makes a huge difference because we live in a cumulative life, but the accumulation is made up of pieces. And we need to pay attention to every piece because really what, what we lived a moment ago is not the same moment we're breathing in right now. When we left Gan Eden, when we were cast away from Gan Eden, I would like to look at it as it being almost a gift. Because when you're in Gan Eden, life is limitless. And when you know you have all the time in the world, you live it differently. But when you, it's outside of Gan Eden that we recognize in the Galut, in the exile, we recognize here in our life right now that every moment counts. Life is not limitless here. And not only does every moment count, but everything that I do in my life, every will, every thought, every word, every feeling, and every action that I do makes a difference. So what is the legacy? And here's where I'll probably get my first emotional crackdown. I was thinking to myself, what is legacy? What is legacy? What what does that mean? And by the way, I want to give full credit to Sarah Esther because she's the one that gave the outline for all these eight steps. I didn't know what we were, should be talking about. I just came up with the grand idea of eight steps. I like that eight steps. I said eight classes to one because one Rosh, you know, Rosh Chodesh, Rosh Hashanah, you know, the beginning of the year, the one, a 5781. I came up with all these dazzling ideas, but I had no idea what we were going to talk about all these eight times. And then Sarah Esther came up with such a beautiful accumulative And so when she, you know, when I had to prepare the class, it wasn't my idea. I was like, okay, well, what do I do with this? And I'm thinking about the one, the one persona in my life out of many, but the one central persona of my life that I would like to emulate the, um, the, the, the legacy of that particular persona. And of course, who is my Rebbe? The Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh. And I'm thinking to myself, what do I remember? What is it about the Baal Shem Tov that I I want to remember, that I want to integrate, that I want to internalize? How does he inspire me today? Because what he does for me and endless people around the world, I don't want to give a number because I want to keep it as an endless number, is is because of the way he lived his close to 70 years, 
on planet Earth. And I think about his legacy and I think about what it's done for me. And I believe that a legacy is based on the impact. What impact does he have? Does he have on me personally? I can't answer for anybody else. What does he inspire me to do today? What is it that I want to empathize, identify, emulate with, with the Baal Shem Tov Israel Ben Eliezer, Slutot Again Aleinu Kolam Yisrael, Amen. And I'm thinking to myself that when I hear his stories, and he says in his will and testament, don't talk about the miracles that came through me. I want my legacy to be how much I love Am Yisrael. I want them to tell stories about my love, my intense love for every Jew, how I loved every person for who they are, how I lived off the last words of my father on his deathbed when I was only five years old, when he said, truly, truly, I want you to love every Jew for who they are. I want you to honor every creature, every creation for where they are and who they are. That is the legacy that he wanted to leave behind. That is the legacy that I hope to tap into in terms of trying to emulate that. And yes, little old me, little old me in my little corner of this universe, in this little place here in Ramat Bet Shemesh, Israel. I don't know me myself what difference I make in anybody's life. You know, when you, you, when you teach, you really don't know I remember in the beginning when I started writing the Daily Dose of Amuna, I kept thinking to myself, eh, who's going to want to read this stuff? I mean, I like it because it speaks to my heart, but I don't know if anybody's interested. In it. I would pop it out, you know, send it out and we'll see. And I remember every time till today, a decade later, every time someone says to me, they read something, I'm like, really? You read it? <laughs> like, I don't, it, it, it's because you don't know, but yet you do it because you have belief in yourself, that you feel that if it inspired you, then there's so many other people that are waiting to be inspired by it as well. So yes, little old me can make a little difference. I can make a difference. My relationship with Hashem in the four corners of my home, as Sarah Esther so eloquently said, I don't need to be a rocket scientist. I don't need to be the head of a worldwide organization. I don't need to be gaining and training or winning a gold medal to say that I matter in this, in this life. Hashem created me to be an extension of his life. And every single one of you, whether you're here live or you're hearing this as a recording in 10 years from now, God willing, Geula by then, the idea of living in a more godly conscious manner means you're creating life. It means that your life force is all powerful and even for those who are not necessarily and unfortunately there are what are you going to do there are the kids who have yet to discover their godly light they're still living out godly consciousness and why you may ask but how is that it's because they're living out god's plan and who are we to say that if they don't recognize who's the planner that they're not living out the plan you know, even the architect that draws up his drawings is not, not on site when the builders are building. The architect's imprint is still in the building. And even those kids, or those times in our life where we don't find Hashem, we're still in contact with him because the vital force that allows us to breathe, that allows our eyes to twinkle, that enables the cells in our body to regenerate, it's God. And so we're living out godly consciousness. So whether we can define it of consciousness or knowing, doesn't matter. But for those of us who do live out godly consciousness in a conscious way, knowing every time that we perform a mitzvah, that we work on our mitas and our character traits and we refine, our, refine ourselves, we join together with the prophets, the sages, the fathers, the mothers of the past, the Baal Shem Tovs and his disciples per se, you know, when I put the Baal Shem Tovs, meaning that consciousness, right? We live out their legacy. 
not only do we live out their legacy, but by extension, we create our own through the continuity of us reliving that life. I'm going to say something that is very, very goosebumpy. I don't know. I've just invented a word. Goosebumpy. The word that we use for the closet, the cabinet, that holds a Torah scroll, scroll is called an Aron. And it's, we know, we put this, the Torah scrolls in an Aron, the Luchot are in Aron. But you know when you also use the word Aron in placing a dead body into the Aron before you bury the person? And it makes you wonder, it makes you wonder, how is it, I mean, Hashem is all perfect and, and, and really knows what he's doing when he created the Hebrew language. How is it that the same word depicts a place where you put living Torah scrolls, instructions for life, and yet it holds the same, the same word is used for placing a body in a casket. And here we know and we can understand the association that when the person uses their body to live out the words of Torah, and again, I'm saying, I'm talking to those of us who know people who maybe don't consciously do that, but every time we recognize that there is a creator in the world, no matter how much or how little we do with it personally, right? We're essentially remaining pure and intact with the words of Torah. In other words, our life, our body is like a Torah scroll because it contains the living word of God. And every time we attach ourselves to the living word of God, God, we essentially are attaching ourselves to the same meaning of the encasement of that which holds the loving living Torah. I want to talk in a couple of moments about the idea of memory, of Yiskor, but before I do, I want to make the connection of what it means a day of, of remembrance. And we open up Rosh Hashanah with, with you know, the idea, all these beautiful Hagim, like so many of the Hagim, we open up with Yiskor. So I was thinking to myself, talking about legacy, what do we remember? And or what do I want to have remembered after I leave? That's what legacy is about. What is it? What is that image? What is that, that experience, right? How much do I want people, what, how much of my life do I want people to recognize and remember? And I'm sorry, I'm talking in the I, but I'm of course referring this to every single one of us, right? In order for me to, re to, to know how I want to leave the world, I have to know how I want to live in this world. So I, I came up with a, with a list of five questions that seemed right to me, and I'm encouraging everyone to write it down, and I think to answer these questions for themselves, because I think it's important that we ask these five questions, particularly as we approach Rosh Hashanah, because the books of life and death are presented in front of Hashem, on the days of Rosh Hashanah. And I think that if I want to be inscribed in the book of life, I also need to know what it feels like to be in the book of death. I, I, want, I want to know what it feels like in both places because left, a life is, you know, we said there's life before death and there's life after death. They're both really two sides of the same coin. I need to know, how do I want to live my life? So question number one that I think we need to all ask ourselves. Did I live a life that was expected of me, but that I didn't really care to live? In other words, is the life that I'm living right now the life that I feel is mine? Or is it based on other people's values? How much of it is? We know to some degree we all do, but how much? Give it a percentage. You know, be very accurate, be very specific when you answer this question. Number two, did I spend, I'm gonna, I, sorry I'm saying it in the past, but you can obviously say it in the present, right? Do I spend 
too much time working, right? In other words, it, it, what, with me doing work, what am I working towards? I'm spending time working, but what am I working towards? Is it too much? Am I spending too much time away, sort of like running away from what I ultimately need to be doing in my life? Am I running away? Basically, you can ask the question here as well. If I don't work, let's say out of the house, am I running away from living my true life? We can ask that as well. And again, put percentages to it, be specific. Don't just say a yes or no. This requires really in-depth thought. Number three, do I, did I, I mean, obviously this is something we would ask at the end of our life, but let's, we're all alive till 120. Did I share my feelings enough? Do I show my, share my feelings enough? Do I express my feelings with those people? Whether it is bitter feelings, whether it is happy feelings, whether it was gratitude feelings, how open am I with my experience of emotions with those people around me? How much do I let people in to my emotional experience? Very important because my emotions kind of will dictate who I really am. And I want to share that because if I want people to know me, they've got to know what I'm feeling. So for the bitter or the better, I've got to be able to not repress those. Okay. Number four, who do I neglect? Who do I wish I would spend more time with? I don't want to live in a regret. So I have to ask myself, if I only had one more day, right? Who would I feel I should have, could have, would have? Those are anti-Amuna words. I know I always encourage everyone not to say those words, but for the purpose of us understanding, right? Um, purpose of, of our own life, we need to ask that question, right? Who, who did I neglect? Who, who should I, I invest more time with in my life? And last but not least, and I know the end goal of life is not to be happy. I didn't say that life is about being happy. Life is not about being happy. However, I would like to ask the question, am I happy? Was I happy? Am I happy? Am I really content and satisfied with my life? It's a question that I think we all need to be asking ourselves. Like, is this it? Is like this really good for me? And of course, if not, then we have to be able to conceptualize for ourselves in more detail what it what that means, what it would take for us to be more happy, right? If this was something that obviously, hopefully it matters to all of us that we should be happy. Now I wanna end off by just saying one last thing before I do something a little bit different at the end of our class. I'm also not gonna be doing a meditation, but I, I want us to meditate on something that I'm gonna be playing on the background. I'll get to that in a minute. So I was trying to, to figure out you know, how to deal with these conflicting emotions of joy and trepidation. On one hand, I said this last class, we're, we're dressed, we're required to dress in white, wear something new, say shechianu, eat new fruits, have all these simanim, be in high anticipation of an amazing new year, new gzerot, God willing, whatever that means, virus, no virus, vaccines, no vaccines, we want geula, that's all we care about. <laughs> Whatever happens in between, whatever, how you bring it, you want to bring this, you want to bring that, I don't care. My end goal, Gaula. We want you, Hashem, which is what I'm going to get to at the end of the class. But how, how, you know, how am I supposed to live in this experience of being joyful? On the other hand, it's like you hear the shofar, you're ready to crack at the seams. I mean, I hope all of us do. It's, if you're not scared of the shofar at the time of the shofar, I don't know what is going to crack open our hearts, right? So I looked inside a little bit of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the commentaries of what it, wh where does it say, it would talk about Dean, where does it talk about judgment, where does it talk about Simcha, where does it talk about Chag, of it being a festival. And what I came up with was that Rosh Hashanah is called Yom Hadin, the day of judgment by our sages, but the Torah does not call Rosh Hashanah Yom Hadin. The Torah depicts, the sages do, but Torah in and of itself, um, in three specific places in Vayikra and Bamidbar, speak about Rosh Hashanah, listen to this, as being Yom Tru'a, Yom Zikron Tru'a, the day of the blowing of the horn. 
And that's how it's basically described in, in, in again, by Ikra and by Midbar in two different places. So let's understand this a little bit more and then we'll hopefully understand how to live in that con contradicting, conflicting state of emotional um, space where essentially now, again, on one hand, I'm supposed to be living in the experience of the joy, anticipation, hope in the good decrees. On the other hand, there is the shofar. How do we reconcile between those two very extreme opposite pole emotions? So again, if Yom, if Yom Rosh Hashanah, the Chag of Rosh Hashanah, is known to be called by the Torah scriptures as a day of blowing of the horn, what I'm not going to go into the details of what the back and forths of how they came to the conclusion, but the conclusion of this um, this defining this definition, these, this usage of, of Yom HaTorah is concluded by understanding that what it means is, is that by the blowing of the shofar, we are supposed to come to a place where we're remembering something, right? There's, it's basically a day of remembrance through the blowing of the shofar. And what are we supposed to remember, Chazal, bring down? We're supposed to pay special attention to the memory that lies within us, that Hashem has, is paying special attention to us. That's what the shofar is supposed to remind us, that Hashem is waking us up and saying, hey guys, remember, I'm in. I'm in your life. I'm in the picture. I'm running your, the world. We're supposed to remember Hashem's intimate hashgacha and divine providence. And we're supposed to be removed from the thought, God is hidden. He's not here, God forbid. He, God forbid, forgot about us. No, 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 no. Rosh Hashanah, you should be remembering God every breathing moment, particularly, oh, every, every day, every moment, every breath, but particularly Rosh Hashanah. And the shofar is meant to, to awaken us, right? That blow of the horn is supposed to renew within us God's special guidance and care to remember that, that Hashem intimately is involved and guides over the Jewish people. And it's in schut, in the merit of us remembering that with the blowing of the shofar, that we will be zocheh, and merit be'ezrat Hashem, every single one of you, all of Am Yisrael, all of creation, everyone in the world will have the merit to the Yeshuot that they yearn for, and at the forefront of that, the redemption. Okay? So remember, one of the most important things we need to be in in the mindset is remember, Hashem is with me. Hashem is with me every moment. He's not hiding. He's taking good care of me. Everything that I'm going through, it's all from Him. You want to add in another cherry on the cake? It's all good. Okay, but even if you can't get to the cherry, just put nice whipped cream on it, sprinkles, and say, yes, Hashem, you are with me. You are reigning over the world even when I don't know it, and it's hiddenness and hiddenness, and I don't remember. But today, Rosh Hashanah, the blowing of the horn is going to remind me to renew my amuna that I know you're in charge of the world. And that, Chazal brings down, is the reason why we should be joyful. That is the reason why we should be happy and it's called a festivity and we're supposed to wear white and we're supposed to be with, with an elated spirit. It's a festivity, it's a holiday because we know that Hashem is with us and He hasn't abandoned us. Yippee! I'm so happy I brought that to my attention. But wait a minute. I still have to reconcile Yom Adin, the day of judgment. Where does Yom Adin come in here? We say, just say to us, it is a day where it says, Kol olam ovrim lefanecha kivnei maron. Every nook and cranny of creation is going to be scanned by you. Going to scan you. Literally, you're going through a scanning machine and every part of you, every particle, every cell, every subatomic as as aspect of your being is going to be checked. <laughs> scared of living. Like, 
Talk about trepidation and fears like things I don't even know about. Mitzvahs I thought I did, which are really averas. Times I thought I did good and it really are bad. Words I spoke that I thought were truthful that were really lies. Moments where I thought I said brachas with kavana and they were really schmutz. Like everything, everything about me. What does that mean for me? How am I supposed to be in that place of, of enjoyment, knowing that I'm being scanned? So where does the Yom Adin come in? Not only from the fact that we're definitely being judged and we understand that we're being scanned, but what causes the fear and trepidation, Rav Cook brings down a fascinating idea. He says, the reason why we're really afraid what did we just say a moment ago? Hashem, you have a shkaha. You're with us every moment, even if I don't notice it. Even if I think you're hiding, you're not hiding. I'm hiding. I've been the one. I pulled the curtain. Not you. You don't change. It's one of the, the most important things we have to remember. Ani Hashem lo shiniti. I think it's Sefer Malachi. It says, Ani Hashem lo shiniti. Hashem doesn't change. There's no expiration date. There's no time, value, essence, space. Nothing. Hashem never changes. We change. Avera means avar ya. We, when we create, when we unfortunately engage in misdeeds, avar ya, we move ourselves to the other side of Hashem. And there's so many different hints I can come to that. Chet also has a pesha. Every single one of those words of misdeeds basically cause, means we separated. We pulled the curtain. I pull the curtain. I say, oh, where's the sun? Well, you pull the curtain. The sun is still out there. You're not experiencing it, but it's still sunny out on the cloudiest days. Even if there's a thunderstorm, you think the sun went anywhere? Lahab deal. Hashem doesn't change. He didn't stop. He's not, he didn't leave. He didn't abandon the world. So how do, what, what do I do with this? So Rav, Rav Cook says something fascinating that makes us understand that we're going to be living, yes, in those two particular days of Rosh Hashanah, we're going to be living in this dual reality of joy and trepidation. Gila and Ra'ada both of them at the same time. And he says like this, he says, since the destruction of the Batei Migdash, since the destruction of our temples, what has happened essentially is that we lost our identity as a nation. We, so to speak, as a whole people, we're no longer, so to speak, umbrellaed under this whole Jewish nation togetherness as we gather together in one place we all had this one unification under so to speak the 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 abad of the bet the the beta beta mikdash so he says so now today each and every one of us we're really remembered as individuals yes we go and daven in a minion and we try to do as 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 much Kinosim and community work that we possibly can, but we feel it in the essence, the, the punishment, so to speak, of the exile of not having the Bet Mikdash means you and me and them and they and all every we're individuals. We it's hard for us to to sort of maintain this unity, this wholesomeness, right? And and it's like now we can't hide amongst many. I can't hide in the midst of the merit of everyone else. Of course there is that aspect. Of course what a tzaddik does in Australia is going to affect me in Israel and it's going to affect the other person in Brooklyn and in Philadelphia and so on. Of course, but it lost something. We lost a little bit of our, a little lot of bit of our identity. And so when we stand in judgment, we sense that I'm alone as the day of death. Who's with me in my grave? Only me. There's no one else in that own. It's only me. And so that creates a sense of fear. And that is what we feel when we're fearful on the day of Rosh Hashanah. And I'm sorry, I don't, I don't like to take out, so to speak, the whip. That's not my, my way. But I believe that when we say to Hashem on Rosh Hashanah, Avinu Malkeinu, which is what I'm bringing up next, Avinu means I serve Hashem from that place of joy. But Malkeinu means there's a place of trepidation. You're my king. I'm your revered servant. And so can you find favor? Can I find favor in your eyes? I'm your servant. Like 
there is that reverence, there's that awe, there's that distance. And so I felt like in order to be able to really bring this home, I found a most amazing song by Eitan Katz. And he sings a beautiful song called Avinu Malkeinu. I'm happy to share the link. He sings it live in Yerushalayim. And I want to play four minutes of his song. I'm going to skip through. It's usually, it's about eight minutes long, this particular version. And I want us to meditate on a couple of things that he's in the middle of his beautiful, when, when he sings, many times him and his brother, also Rav Shlomo Katz, they tend to speak while they're still playing. And I find it's so beautiful when you could sort of teach while you're still playing. There's something about the music and the words really penetrate. So in the middle, about two minutes into when we're going to hear him sing, and I'm going to ask that all of us close our eyes and just listen Listen to what he is singing and listen to the nigun and listen to his words because I'm going to say them now and I want us all to focus on what he says in the, in the, in the emotional space that he also says it. He says like this. He says, we want, he says, Avinu Malkeinu, we want just you. Elanu Melech. Elanu Melech. We have no other king. Ela Atta. Only you. There's no other king, and I don't want anybody else. I want only you. I want you to be my Malkinu, my Avinu. I don't want anybody else. And he says something so beautiful and so touching. He says, let me spend my entire life wishing that for just one moment, one moment I can retain that Ela Atta. Like I said, I think it was... Last class, a few classes ago, what, what is my achat sha'alti? So now I'm, I'm begging us all to say, how important is it for us to say ela ata? Just you. We don't want anything else. I want one moment of clarity, and I want it Rosh Hashanah. One moment of clarity to know I want nothing else in this entire universe. Achat sha'alti, I want only you. I want nothing else. How truthful are we? Because that is a healthy dose of joy and trepidation. We're not talking about fearing, being in a place of fear to the point where we, you know, oh, I better do it, otherwise I'm gonna get struck. That's not, that's not, that's not a healthy dose of trepidation. I'm talking about having a fear of losing you, Hashem. That's like the ultimate fear. I'm afraid. I want, I'm going to let you all in into a little secret, and I'm going to let us listen. I'm sorry this went over time, but I feel like it's, come on, if it's not now, then when? All I've been davening for, for the last couple of weeks, particularly since the beginning of Elo, I'm just davening for one thing. Don't let me lose my Amuna Hashem. The Nisyonot are getting very hard whether they're mine personally or whether I hear about them from other people around the world. Every day I get emails and WhatsApps and cries. Don't let me lose my amuna. Just let me always remember that you are here with me, which is exactly what we're talking about. Do you daven for that? Do you daven to Hashem and ask him, don't let me forget you at that moment of insanity when I lose my brain because I'm so emotionally decrepit don't let me forget you. I need to hold on. This is my only sanity. My only sanity is remembering you. So let's listen um, to Eitan Katz. And but Islat Hashem, let's see where it takes us in terms of our journey. And so I'm going to invite everyone to just find a quiet space, okay? Find a quiet space within yourself and just close your eyes and just listen. And just meditate on what he's saying. Really go into it. Be with the words. Be with it. Let's take it to the next level. Everyone sing as loud as you can. Again, sorry. Take two. Yeah. 
And our boy and said right before Nilo, there was once a fussing who was singing this thing again with other fussy. And he got up on the high part and he made a clap and he said, I've been no Malkainu, ain't no no melech. Period. Oh, it's you say those words, ain't no melech. What is this guy? It's crazy. How can he dare say those words even? But the nigga that sounds like it. Ain't no melech, ain't no melech. It's almost like, oh, how can you even say those words? And then the chassid started crying. We don't want a king. Ella Ata. We just want you. We just want you before the events. We know it's impossible. We know that we're Basar Vedam and we can't be massive when it means you, just you, without any shameless, without any descriptions. The only way we can relate to this Barfu is through Avin, through Malkainu, Pael Givura, Yisus Yeshua, Yisman Hamas. Of course, that's the only way we can relate. But my Sheifa is Ella Ata. You, Rebbeinu Shalom, just you. And even if I know I'll never be able to get it, but at least let me spend my entire life wishing that for one moment. That for one moment I can reach that element. Just that one moment of clarity of knowing exactly who you are. I have no Oh, 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 oh,
the experience that I've been um, sorry to end it so drastically but that's when the music ended but just allowing yourself to listen to some of those words and I just felt like those six minutes uh, I listened to the whole thing I kept repeating to myself over and over again that what we ask on Rosh Hashanah is we say to Hashem rule over the whole world in your honor and every creature, every creature will understand that you created him. And every living being will say, God of Israel is the king, and his majesty reigns over all. Hashem Eloke Israel Malach Umalchuto Akol Mashala. That is what we need to be thinking of and meditating on over the next couple of days, God willing, on Rosh Hashanah itself. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining us for these beautiful eight sessions. Um, Sarah Esther, I'm going to ask you in a moment. Um, I just want to um, notify everyone who listens to this how they can reach me. And I also want you to be able to take the mic and just remind everyone how they could reach out to you. Um, first of all, I want to make um, you know note there are women who are asking me, how can we stay in touch? How can we continue to learn? How can we grow? And so I want to invite everyone to the new um, spot of uh, you know the Daily Dose of Amuna. We have now a sister website, or amunaenergy.com, where. Um, there's an array of various different holistic, Jewish holistic um, Torah programs. I'm teaching a gemstone program starting right after um, Simcha's Torah. We're going to learn about the Koach of Avnei Chen. By the way, if you're interested, um, I just learned about an amazing new product that you can also purchase um, on upliftmyhealth.com. It's a beautiful quartz, silicon quartz, crystal-based pillow that's really good for stress. I happen to have one at home and I use it. I'm going to you know, recommend that you also, maybe now is a time where we all need to have a little bit of a boost of something to help us with our stress. So it's upliftmyhealth.com. Uh, I have no connection to it. It's just a friend of mine who actually sells these pillows who... It happens to be an amazing product. Um, but in general, I'm inviting everyone to stay in touch with, the, with me through dailydoseofamuna.com or amunaenergy.com. Um, and I, I want to bring the microphone over to Sarah Esther. I want to thank you all for joining us, for being here with us. You motivated me to work on myself over the next, uh, you know, the last eight weeks, uh, four weeks and eight classes. And uh, Sarah Esther, thank you for being my chavruta. Thank you for being my buddy, my learning buddy and learning teacher. So please tell everyone where we can get a, get a hold of you. Some of people have asked me. Okay, so before we part ways, I'm going to share that I have a privilege of knowing Arit Esther from a personal standpoint. And, um, you know, as I said in one of my classes, if a homeless person was to say you that, you know, vanity of vanities, right? The, the, that famous phrase from Kohelet, Right. But if a King Solomon who had it all and he said it, you want to learn from him. What does it mean that really not? It's nothing, nothing. We can't take socks with us. So Reed Esther is a very powerful teacher. She has been tested numerous times in her personal life and she had emerged with dignity and with hope and with Amuna. And I think it's a privilege for all of us to learn from someone that just doesn't talk about what they don't know about, but that is a living example, a real legacy what it is to continue marching through life despite very difficult circumstances. So thank you so much. I humbly, I humbly learn from you and continue to learn from you. 
Um, I uh, spend a lot of hours of my day writing for Chabad.org. I don't do it, obviously, for any other financial compensation or anything of that sort. I do it because I share people's stories. I share my own experiences. If you were to go to Chabad.org and type Sophia Sarah Esther Tamarkin, uh, you'll come up with quite a few articles. There's many stories that might, I hope, inspire people. I get a lot of emails from all over the world. There's stories about my journey, about um, how I found out that I was Jewish at the age of 10 and what I've done with that. There's a story about many, many people, converts, people that are able to find light in the moment of darkness. And they inspired me enough that I sat down and put everything aside and wrote about them. Because as I write about them, I find that I write my own map from my inner world by learning from them. So it would be my honor and privilege if you read them and study and and we are, who is wise, the one who learns from everyone, right? Back, I'm so sorry, my computer glitched, I apologize. Um, in addition to the uh, Chabad.org, I am a life coach, and uh, and if you have questions, you can always email me at howdoigrow at hotmail.com, howdoigrow at hotmail.com. I also have a website, sophiatamarkin.com, my name, sophiatamarkin.com, and I Hope to learn from all of you. So please write to me, inspire me so we could uh, be each other's teachers because I try to be wise and learn from everyone. Thank you again for all your time and commitment to this program, Marit Esther. And hopefully this will be a year of transcendence, joy, connection, when we crown our king for the right reasons from the right place and write our dash of destiny in this world. Amen, amen. I also want to leave us all off with a beautiful Bezlat Hashem Mabracha. God willing, Hashem should enable His beautiful, compassionate, endless, revealed loving kindness and light to be revealed without and within each and every one of us. We should become the conduits of light that Hashem created us to be, everyone in their own right. Like I said, you don't have to be you know, the uh, on New York, the New York Times, who wants to be there anyway, but <laughs> you don't have to be, you know, advertised in any big newscasts or papers to be, to really grow into the shining, beautiful ball of light that you are already. Just get to know yourself, get to love yourself more and more and recognize the one who created you loves you more than you love yourself, more than you ever know yourself to be the beautiful you that you are. And I'm sending blessings, endless, endless, endless blessings. I die of health, of happiness, of Yiddish Anachat, of Zivug, Zerba Kayama, Refua, Parnasa. Hashem should answer everybody, but Asher who, wherever you are, whatever you need, Hashem should open up the gates of abundance treasure in the most revealed kind way and, and shower down upon every single one of you of Klal Yisrael. All the, the creatures and creations of the world should receive their abundance flow. And Be'ezlat Hashem, we should merit the Geula Shlema, where Hashem's loving kindness will ultimately be revealed so that everyone will know. Everyone will know who is the one who is the, the wondrous one who is uh, essentially bringing into being every moment of creation as we know it and as we experience it. So sending lots of hugs, Amuna hugs, stay in touch with uh, both Sophia and, and myself. And God willing, we should only know happiness and health. Have a wonderful, wonderful end of the rest of the year, a wonderful new year. Lots of love.